Welcome, 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 geeks and nerds, girls and boys, to a brand new episode of geek to me Radio. Today we are joined by the owner of Justin's Comics, Justin Burnett, talking about operating a local comic book store during this COVID pandemic. Then we're joined by writer extraordinaire Richard Dinnick, talking about a fun fan casting project he's been doing on his Twitter lately. Stand by. And for those of you who are streaming us out there in the world, thank you for finding us. And of course, if you're hearing us in the podcast form on Google Play, iTunes, SoundCloud, Podomatic, or iHeartRadio, thank you for finding us there. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't ever miss an episode and keep up with our shows as they come out. I'm your host, James Enstall, and we've got two special guests this week. I'm very excited to chat with both these gentlemen. We're going to dive right in. Right now, we've got Justin Burnett, the owner of Justin's Comics in St. Charles. Justin'sComics.shop is the website, and we're talking about uh, how he's handled things during COVID-19, as well as the light at the end of the tunnel we're seeing. Justin, how are you? Good. Thanks again for having me on. Absolutely. Uh, it's been a while. Obviously, I've seen it. It's been a while since we've had you on because uh, we've missed free comic book day now, which was huge. Obviously, comics haven't been shipping. A diamond shut down. Talk a little bit about how you have continued on. I know you've done curbside pickup and stuff, but what's been the response that you've heard from your customers and also online? Yeah, we've transitioned a lot to online sales where we've really built up the online store more. We've done curbside pickup as well. Um, luckily, we had a lot of inventory saved back when this happened, so we started posting a lot of that online. It was enough to weather the storm. You know, of course, it wasn't. we didn't boom because of it, but... Um, I was able to keep one of my employees on at, at you know, reduced hours, and um, we were able, able to make it through it. Um, what happened was, and what has happened across across a lot of the world, is, is the industry collapse of comic books, which um, was, of course, devastating to the industry in the whole and to a lot of, to a lot of stores. So at the very, I guess, about a month and a half ago, and when this stuff really, really started to hit, um, I had a little bit of a breakdown moment. At, you know, I, I remember one night going home and just crying for like an hour um, after there's going to be no new comic book day. Now, you mentioned the light at the end, end of the tunnel. If any any, any kind of collapse that haps, happens, it is rebuilding. I mean, Batman and Spider-Man comics aren't going to stay out of print forever. DC's coming back in print. Um, you know, we're working on balancing reopening. Next week, possibly, it looks like tomorrow I'm, I'm going to go to the store tonight to do some more work and some more work on the online store to reopen and try to keep the keyword in their balance because we're reopening with balancing safety restrictions and a stable financial plan going forward. Um, so everything it is looking more stable, more better. We've got multiple distributors now. DC Comics, new DC Comics are coming out now. Um, some of the indies are already coming out. Uh, Marvel is supposed to be back May 27th. Um, so there's a lot of good things that are starting to develop. They're, the industry is building back, which is great. And it's very interesting because a lot of people, uh, with everything digital, everything's online, a lot of people, maybe even a year ago, six months ago, were questioning, well, the brick and mortars, are they really going to be viable? But I think this is seen from the reaction I've followed on people on social media. People miss the local comic book store. They miss going to the store to pick out their comics and talk to the other shoppers. And it's a camaraderie. It's a shared communal experience that you can't get online. So I think that also, after all this craziness, kind of bodes well for the fact that brick and mortar comic book stores going forward aren't really going to go away. Oh, most definitely, Ed. 
comic books are unique um, in comparison to other books like you know magazines or, or prose novels and that it has more of a social atmosphere it also has collectability it has artwork things that actually matter in person compared to you know a people magazine doesn't have those other right. elements in, involved with that um so yeah it's a whole whole different unique um different and then like digital sales before the something that's uh, with comic books is on percent of the industry sell per sell per study, meaning that only a certain amount of those people are just going to do digital. The rest of them are still going to want to do their print. They're still going to want to go in stores. Um, they, you know, they, they preach the whole, you know, the whole, um, the, the whole different, you know, different um, sides of comic books. Yeah, exactly. And I know, Again, with uh, it would be devastating for a comic book store that had literally just opened in, say, January. Uh, you've been around for this is you're you're either in your third year or you're starting your fourth, if I'm not mistaken. We'll be on our third year. October is going to be our, our three year anniversary. So okay, so yeah, we're yeah. Thankfully, it wasn't our first year. Right? Yeah, because um, you built up a fan base and you built up a clientele. So that's been, I think, critical in the fact that and the curbside service you're doing that's kept you going. Yeah, and and we like you said we had that fan base. We had a lot of people that, that still did curbside with us. Um, we started reaching out more online as well. Um, we had a lot of inventory already backed up, um, so that was good. We got to get you know dig into some of our back stock and do that. Um, and like I said, it's been a lot of ups and downs. I mean, you know, emotionally even over the last month and a half, because a lot of stores. We would have been celebrating a um, free comic book day yesterday. Yeah. And um, that's kind of like the Black Friday or like the holiday of comic book stores is free comic book day. Um, but, you know, after, like I said, after getting through this, the ups and downs of the month and a half, I'm feeling more optimistic. Well, way, way more optimistic than I did a month and a half ago. Good. Um, and thing, like I said, I'm starting to see that light in the tunnel. Thing, things are looking better. Um, customers really came together pretty well with like helping, you know, keep the store going. Um, people did keep buying from us, keep contacting us. And we kept contacting people too. And obviously the, you mentioned free comic book day. This is, this has definitely changed the landscape. Diamond distributing, uh, shut down completely. Uh, it's kind of led the publishers to kind of say, well, is there a different way to get the comic books out there since, uh, as a person who's kind of in the industry, you own the comic book store, you're dealing with some of this. What have, what has been the most surprising thing that you've noticed from the publishers themselves? I would say the, the if there is some, you know, good to get out of all of this, we have more options than we have in years. Um, definitely more options than we did before, as far as other like distribution routes, other ways of getting the comic books than before. Um, for the first time, it's not just all through Diamond. DC Comics are, are using three different distributors now. Hmm. So we got three different ways of going through that. Some of the, like Alterna Comics, I'm a certified retailer with them. So now I'm, I'm dealing directly with them and ordering comics from them. Uh, so a lot more with the local comic shops direct publishers than you ever did before. And have you, and I, have any of the publishers uh, offered any kind of, uh, not assistance per se, but uh, had they reached out and said, hey, you know, because obviously they probably lost several comic book stores that couldn't weather the storm like you did. So they've obviously got fewer places to now sell their comics. Have they offered you any kind of incentives? Has there been any kind of, uh, I guess, incentives from the publishers themselves or from distributors? Yeah, I'm noticing them more willing to work with us directly. They're more willing to, to co-promote. Um and I, you know, about like, I guess, giving up too much of the details of it. Yeah, it's better. <laughs> good, good. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot better working with them overall on that. And like I said, you have more options than you ever did before. Um, and it's it's really, I mean, it's just a cool aspect to have. You know, independent publisher help out an independent store. Yeah. You know, and you co-promote together, and that, that that's really what it's about. And I obviously with people not getting the uh, the current issues for the past month or so, we've had you on the show before to talk about trends in comics, what's hot, what's selling. 
with no new comics, what have you found people have been buying from you? Is it, are they rediscovering, uh, like bronze age issues? Are they kind of flocking more towards the independent titles and away from Marvel and DC? What's been the trend you've been seeing as far as your online sales and curbside pickup? You know, it's jumped around a little bit. It looks like people have been kind of digging in the closet gaps here and there. They went to food stories they'd never read before. Graphic novel sales have been pretty solid. Um, as far as like key comics or collectible comics, people are really, you know, people aren't, of course, dishing out like, you know, buying $500 comics right now. Right. But the $10, $20 collectibles that are still affordable that maybe they, you know, they've missed out or, or wanted before, they're, they're filling in some small collectibles like that too. Um, some of the Bronze Age comics, um, variants and independents are still pretty popular with us, which even we've been known for having a lot of variants and independents by, I, plan to even expand even more on that within the upcoming weeks. So it's a lot of, a lot of gap filling, a lot of variety going on right now. And how about collectibles? I know you've got a lot of in your store, uh, action figures, games, Funko pops. Has that slowed down and people have been mostly doing comic books or has it been a pretty even mix? Yeah, it's been mostly books. It's been mostly geared for entertainment. Um, I think people are holding off on the toys and I've had, I've had some people get a lot of statues. Maybe they're decorating their home. Um, a lot of the mid-level toys, I think people are waiting for the in-store experience on those. Yeah. Um, or, you know, maybe maybe have one of their kids point at it for them, and that might push them <laughs> right. a little bit. Um, but it's it's been really geared towards the reading and the and the, the book collectibles right now. Perfect. And it's, uh, like I said, very glad you're staying afloat. We always, uh, we've been telling people we've had some artists and authors on the show and that's one of the things they've always been universal in encouraging is go to your local comic book store, buy from them. So if if you're obviously if you're in the St. Louis area, we always recommend Justin's Comics for many reasons. But if you're hearing this uh, and you're out in a different state, you're not in Missouri, you might be in Canada, go find your local comic book store. Find out if they're doing curbside pickup and please help support them. Let everyone know if they want to uh, visit your online store and things like that, where they can get a hold of you on social media and things like that, Justin. Yeah, we're online at um, justinscomics.shop. We're also on Facebook at Justin's Comics and Instagram at Justin's Comics. And then I believe Twitter is Justin's Comics 1. So you can find us on a lot of different social media. And we're um, there in St. Charles, Missouri, 500 South 5th Street. Perfect. Uh, look forward to coming and seeing the store again once all this quarantine is lifted. So continued success to you, and we'll talk to you very soon. Yeah, thanks for having me on. My thanks once again to Justin Burnett of Justin's Comics. Make sure you're supporting your local comic book store. Uh, Find out they have curbside pickup with some states opening things back up. Make sure if you're able to, while practicing social distancing and being safe, get in there and make sure you, uh, you support them now that they're open back up. We need to make sure that these local businesses, small businesses, continue to thrive. We're going to take our first break. Come back talking with writer Richard Dinnick about his Doctor Who fan casting he'd been doing on Twitter. Stand by. Hello, I'm Sarah Sutton. I play Nyssa in Doctor Who, and you're listening to Geek to Me Radio. And we're back. This segment brought to you by Marcus Theatres. Talk about uh, businesses that have been impacted by the COVID uh, pandemic. Movie theaters are something I miss. I know I've seen a lot of people on Twitter. Uh, A lot of Instagram people I interact with, a lot of people on social media saying, I really miss seeing movies. We missed out on the openings of five or six big ones I was really looking forward to. We're doing what we have to do to stay safe, and Marcus Theaters is doing what they can to help bring the movie-going experience home. You go to the website, marcustheaters.com, you can actually order movie night at home packages. Different levels that uh, they will send you popcorn, movie-sized candy, fountain drinks, snack cash coupons to uh, redeem once the theaters do open back up, which we are starting to see that on the horizon here, uh, light at the end of the tunnel. I'm sure they're as excited as we are to be back in the movie business. Uh, If you have gotten one of these packs, let me know. Uh, Tag me in a picture on Twitter or Instagram, uh, hashtag geek me radio at geek me radio. Let me know you purchased one of these and uh, what you thought, what candies you got. Take a picture and let Marcus Theaters know as well at Marcus Theaters on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, Just go to the website, marcustheaters.com. There's still plenty of movie fun to be had. You can print out coloring pages 
to uh, engage your kids. I know a lot of the schools are obviously closed. Give the kids something to do, color some fun pictures. Um, there's word hunts. There's all sorts of things that Marcus is doing to help us weather this pandemic together. Uh, but obviously, like I said, movie night at home is a fun thing. We did it. We got the Reese's peanut butter cups, the popcorn. We got some raisinets because I always think of Harvey Corman from Blazing Saddles. Raisinets. Uh, <laughs> it's it's it brought the movie experience home. We watched Taylor of Panama on DVD, and it was a great time. So thank you to Marcus Theaters for doing that. Uh, you can thank them too. Go to MarcusTheaters.com. You're helping to support uh, the theater industry by doing this, and you're getting a fun night at home with some fresh movie theater popcorn, candies, and other goodies to enjoy. MarcusTheaters.com is that website for more details and information. Right now, we have our next guest on deck. Right now, we've got author on the phone. Uh, been on the air with us before. I finally got the chance to meet him in person at the recent Gallifrey One. Richard Dinnick, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Doing well, doing well. All the way across in the UK. I love having international guests. Uh, yes. It makes my show seem more <laughs> upper class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they always say that a British accent lends something to, to, the, to the state of affairs. I don't know what that is, but uh, yeah. <laughs> certainly so, certainly so. Um, we've had you on before. We talked about Doctor Who. Uh, you uh, yep. also write for TV and things like that, too. We talked about Lost in Space last time you were on. Yes. But this yes. time, I'm very excited because you've been doing uh, something, a bit of a fan <laughs> casting if Doctor Who were brought into like the modern setting, uh, going all the way back to casting who would be the new William Hartnell. So talk a little bit about how this idea of yours came about. I think I think I must have I was battling uh, to think and racking my brains as to how exactly it did think uh, come about and I think I saw something online about recasting someone uh, or recasting maybe it was James Bond or something like that and I thought oh we could do that for for Doctor Who but I'd only do it um, for the, for classic Doctor Who as it were so up to and including. Um, the eighth doctor and uh, so that's I, I kind of like and that was seemed such an easy <laughs> task um part of it came about because when i put together a, a tv project and even sometimes when it's just a comic book project i'll um uh do fantasy casting so i find it helps a tv producer uh, or executive get a feel for a show if they if I tell them this person this character would do really well played by this actor or actress um so uh that was part of it as well I like to keep up with with actors I know a lot of actors a in person and b just uh who they are and what they're in because that's it's kind of my industry so I should know it um and then, of course, you know, thought thought it would be relatively easy, and then obviously went way too far into it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great because you've even cast uh, you've even cast a master. You've uh, cast a couple of companions for this uh, fan casting you've done. It's been fascinating to watch, and you've had great reaction to it too because you even put out a poll that said, "Hey, should I get into the new Who?" And it was overwhelmingly, <laughs> "Yes, please continue this, Richard." Absolutely, yeah, no, um, really good reactions. I've been doing it on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and the reason I did it in the first place, obviously, is that over here, I think I started it when when we did go into lockdown. We're we're in lockdown. We're only allowed out for uh, food or medicine um, to take one one uh, exercise a day. Or if obviously, if you're a uh, what we call it over here a key worker um, in the uh, medical profession, or the police, or the forces, or teachers, or or even delivery drivers and people who work in, in food stores. So, and I just thought everyone might be going a bit stir crazy, maybe a bit of fun to help people, you know, take their minds off it uh, and get into a debate and say, oh, I think I've always thought this person would make a great first doctor or third doctor or whoever. Um, and I've tried to go in my casting a little bit. There's some obvious choices. Mm -hmm. Um like obviously if you're recasting the third doctor you might um uh you might go for um john's son who's now his name is escaping oh me. yeah sean uh, yeah sure thank you very much um adult brain today <laughs> um uh that you would go for sean pertwee and you know obviously there was that picture of him 
you know, in in the third Doctor's costume that he, uh, I think, he put on Instagram or Twitter one one Halloween uh, when he was going to a costume party. Um, and I just I just thought I'm going to try and not do the too obvious casting. Um, it's the same as um, when I got into the new Who. A few people said Eddie Redmayne, and I was just like, "Yeah, but he didn't he he almost like stole that performance wholesale from Matt Smith." Really those, did uh, <laughs> for those uh, uh, Harry Potter sequel movies, um, and I just thought that's just too. He's even got the same outfit on. I yeah, say. no, that's what my um, comment was, was for uh, the the Fantastic Beasts. I said, "Oh." So it's the eleventh Doctor in Harry Potter's world. That's interesting. <laughs> right, exactly. And and he's even got a you know a um, uh, a device that's bigger on the inside. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, Doctor Who roots are showing uh, there. But anyway, no. So I thought I'd try and delve a bit deeper, do something a bit left field, and also mix it up. Taking today's casting, you know, you wouldn't blink an eye about casting a woman uh, or a person of colour or uh, anything like that. So I tried to, or have been trying to, to mix it up. Um, uh, the first two people, first two doctors I did were white guys, uh, and then I, but then for the third doctor I did a woman, um, and the fourth doctor was uh, Idris Elba. <laughs> so it's like. I was I was trying to be blind to everything apart from the, the person that I really thought, and my kind of own criteria were, was that they would be cast, but then they would play in exactly the same stories with the same lines, and I had to imagine them delivering those lines and um, and being that doctor kind of thing. So Phoebe Waller Bridge would have to reverse the polarity of the neutron flow several times throughout her run. Obviously, I think <laughs> I think she would. I think she would. Uh, you know, I think she'd be brilliant at that kind of, um, you know, uh, wiggling her eyebrows uh, and saying, oh, that's how they say hello in Del- on Delphon, <laughs> um, as well as giving, you know, don't don't glamorize war speech and stuff like that. Um, I think she'd be she'd be both humorous and authoritative. And I could see her working with a paramilitary organization um, and. Uh, yeah, I just I just thought she'd be, and she's posh, and she's kind of, you know, there's that John Pertwee kind of. I think of all the doctors, I think we can agree that he's kind of the most uh, um, kind of down with um, the man, as it were. He is he's part of the establishment, right? Um, even though he's he's kind of a rebel against it and stuff like that. He's he's more like a kind of rebellious. Uh, lord than a rebellious time lord um so i thought you know phoebe what a bridge would bring that to it yeah i think uh that's something that both uh the third doctor and the 12th in my opinion had in common was a yes. huge rebellious streak which again for my money as far as new who peter capaldi is still my favorite doctor of the of the mm. whole new series but he does harken back a lot to uh the older doctors, and he even talked about that during some of his interviews. But tell people, uh, let, let's start by telling people yes. where they can find you if they want to start looking into this, where they can find you on Facebook and Twitter so they can go back and uh, keep up with you and check out the list as it comes out. Yeah, yeah, sure. So uh, on Facebook, I'm just, it's facebook.com slash Richard Dinnick, uh, R-I-C-H-A-R-D-D-I-N-N for November, I-C-K. Uh, and, you know, you can, I, I, um, I'd, any fan can come along, be a friend of mine, and I've got—I can't remember how many people I've got. <laughs> I've got about twelve hundred friends, um, just because people want to kind of like. I do have a professional page, but um, I've been doing this because a lot of my friends, real friends, person, people I actually know in real life, have been to my house and that kind of thing, and uh, are kind of you know semi into Doctor Who or very into Doctor Who. Right. Um, uh, so please come along, find me, friend me um and join in the fun um and uh on twitter it's the same it's twitter.com slash richard dinnick uh you can follow me there and and see all the there's a, a thread of um what if what if new in you uh now it's new doctor who was started now but before it was classic doctor who started now who do we cast and i was i've been doing one doctor a day so we're up to um the 12th doctor uh, today um, 
and I'll be doing my 13th doctor tomorrow. Um, and as you say, I, I think it was like 94% because I wondered if people, because basically now that we're up to, now we're doing New Who, it's like, okay, it was 15 years ago though. So I had to find, also that was the other, one of the other criteria was finding actors who were a very similar age. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of people were suggesting actors. I mean, not that, you know, everyone's got their own, can have their own criteria and play around with it, but to explain why my, uh, my casting choices was that the, the, the actors had to be um, uh, a similar, very similar age. So now, obviously, you couldn't cast um, uh, Eccleston as, as the ninth doctor. Right. Because he's 15 years older. <laughs> so you have to find someone who's, who's younger. Um, and then, obviously, for Jodie, very young. Um, uh, so we'll see who it is tomorrow. Um, uh, and then... Uh, and a, a, a brilliant idea from a couple of people, including Tony Lee, who's another Doctor Who writer. And um, he said, well, why don't you um, go back to uh, – we, we've done casting classic Doctor Who now. Why don't we cast New Who then? Oh. So, so when I've finished – when I've done the 13th Doctor tomorrow – I'm actually going to go and do what if we were casting New Who back in the 60s and 70s. That'll um, be fun. So, yeah, that's been real fun, finding people. And, again, my, a little bit of my criterion was not to have people who were too big in their movie career. Um, so that I, think, I don't think Eddie Redmayne would say yes. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I think, I think you've got to have someone who might accept the role who does do TV. And I haven't, I can't remember ever seeing Eddie Redmayne on TV. I think he's only done movies uh, and, and the theatre. I can't remember him on TV. I could easily be wrong, um, but not for a while anyway. Uh, um, but it's, it's got to be somebody who might accept the role. So I kind of, I kind of fudged it a bit with Idris Elba and Fall, um, just because I couldn't imagine anyone else in the role. And some people have come up with some excellent ideas. And with, I just wanted, I wanted someone who I could imagine giving that, you know, have I the right uh, speech yeah, the in big Genesis speech. Yeah. and the you know, humanity indomitable speech in Ark in Space and then going right up to, you know, um, the kind of slightly uh, comedic nature of, of latter Tom Baker and someone who could run the gamut uh, of, of, and, and, be a re- and be that kind of rich performance and... You know, just see him going, humans, indomitable, be slightly different. It wouldn't be kind of those rich tones, but his performance would be rich enough. But he'd bring his own thing to it. Um, And then uh, with uh, the fifth doctor, um, again, some of these people a little bit kind of up and gone now. But Gemma Chan uh, was my choice for the fifth doctor. Um, I think she'd be brilliant. I'd cast her right now as the 14th Doctor. Um, uh, loved her in in uh, Humans, um, and uh, she was in Crazy Rich Asians. Um, and uh, also I th- Captain I she, Marvel. She was in yeah, uh, indeed, yeah, 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 under some blue makeup. Yes, uh, she was in that as well, definitely. And that's the thing. She's now she's done a couple of few, a few movies, but I think, I think she's still doing TV. And I just thought she was the perfect kind of foil or antidote to my Idris Elba fourth Doctor in the way that Peter Davison was the antidote and foil to Tom Baker's fourth Doctor. So very different Doctor and someone who's kind of uh, not not insecure as much as kind of frustrated by not being taken seriously. Sure. Um, and I kind of was playing with that a bit. Um, so it's been, you know, it's been, it's been um, really good fun to kind of play <laughs> casting director and, uh, and, you know, go for some unusual choices. I haven't had, I've had, like, I've had a couple of people just go, no, that's not right at all. <laughs> you're always going to have some people on the internet who don't like what you're doing. That's, it's fine. That's all good. Um, I mean, I think, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Terence Dix or maybe it was um, oh, someone from that era um, saying um, that the role of the Doctor was actor-proof. And I'm not sure that's 100% true. I think you've got to have someone who can bring something special to the role 
I don't think it is actor proof. I think some actors are just not right for the doctor. Um, I'd never say who they are. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I, I've, I've uh, tried to kind of stick with something, so, something, somebody that brings, I've tried to kind of, in my uh, casting choices, I've put what I was looking for to boil down what I, what I, my, the criteria I gave myself to find someone who had fitted this bill. So like with, um, like yesterday we did the 11th doctor and Matt Smith's just like a very difficult. Okay. You've got Eddie Redmayne, but that's like, you might as well cast Matt Smith again. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, I said, we need someone who's impish, but tall, soft, yet strong, young, yet old, crazy and quirky and unpredictable, capable of gentle concern and seething anger, loud, zany humor and quiet, good humor. And then once I'd thought of this person, I couldn't think of anyone else. And that was Gwendolyn Christie um, uh, from uh, very famous from Game of Thrones and, and the new Star Wars trilogy um, as Captain Phasma, who we never saw, actually, under her helmet. I think we glimpsed her eye, but that was about it. Um, uh, I just think she was she'd be brilliant um, as the Doctor. And again, I'd cast her now. Um, uh, actually, she's the second Star Wars person I've used. I noticed that uh, one of the ones I was most excited about was John Boyega as the Tenth Doctor. Which now I want somehow for maybe the the 60th anniversary for David Tennant's Tenth Doctor to come back, and we have like a, uh, a Doctor like 13 just met a Doctor that she didn't even know about, and it's John Boyega yeah. for ten. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I just I tried to think about because David Tennant is so charming and so. He can play humor really, really well, and he can play uh, pathos really well. And and uh, I I just I when I thought of someone who had who just oozed charm and who just nailed it, you know, you think about how Tennant nailed the Tenth Doctor or being the Doctor in well, a um, you know weird teeth. I oh, know I'll take you to Barcelona. Uh, even <laughs> that couple of lines he'd kind of got it already and you know when he was like um you know woke up and was like oh remote control and you just know that uh, and did you miss me he just he was just brilliant in those in those first couple of scenes as the doctor and just absolutely got it and he again was so young um and i was trying to think of someone who could carry off all those things um and and he actually i didn't even have to go looking i had already Kind of when I got to when I started doing the new Who uh, casting, I um, he he just sprang straight to mind, and then I just thought, yeah, perfect, so absolutely perfect. <laughs> with with the casting you've done, and obviously we we talked about at the beginning, you're you're a screenwriter, you've worked uh, with TV movies, casting people, everything like that, and uh, just your your sphere of people you know have anybody as far as actors who had played these parts originally or the people you've now cast reached out or, you know, retweeted your tweet and said, please make this happen, anything like that at all? We're going to take our next break, come back, and get Richard's answer to that question. So please stand by. Hi, this is Alex Kingston. Welcome back. No spoilers, but you're listening to Geek to Me Radio. We are back here at Geek to Me Radio. We've been talking with writer Richard Dinnick, screenwriter, comic book writer. He does it all. He's very talented. I was uh, fortunate enough to actually meet him this time around at Gallifrey One, the last convention that I went to before uh, everything shut down. Uh, uh, true gentleman, very talented, and while he's doing this Doctor Who fan casting, which was just a fun, fun, phenomenal idea, I asked him if any celebrities had commented on it who he'd mentioned as fan casts. I think someone um, someone tweeted Gemma Chan about it, and I'm a big fan of hers, and I, I follow her on uh, on Twitter, um, and we've had a couple of conversations. Um, but I don't think anyone else, uh, I don't think any of these other guys are actually on Twitter. Um, and I didn't, I didn't use their Twitter handles when I was doing it on Twitter. I didn't want to like, do you know what I mean? Use it as a kind of, ooh, kind of talking to the stars kind right. of thing. I wanted, it, I wanted it to be for the fans. And if it got back to them, you know, um, I don't actually, uh, did 
No, no, it wasn't. No, I was. I thought for a minute. I, I remembered, misremembered something, but it was. Um, <laughs> I thought Rosamund Pike had commented, but it wasn't that. It was something, something totally different. Ignore me. I'll go away. That's all right. Um, <laughs> But talking about Rosamund Pike, you cast her as the eighth Doctor, and you've done, we mentioned a couple of companions, too. Uh, you cast uh, for her, obviously, the eighth Doctor's companion, of da- the, played by Daphne Ashbrook, uh, Dr. Grace Holloway. You cast Joe Carey from Stranger yes. Things, and uh, you cast Lily James, who is absolutely, I love her and everything I've seen, as Sarah Jane. But obviously, certain Doctors have iconic companions. Sarah Jane, for example, Dr. Uh, Grace Holloway. Uh, yes. Other doctors have had so many companions when you look at uh, two and five. So I guess it's, I guess logistically is the why you steered away from, com- uh, stayed away from companion casting? Pretty much. Yeah. Um, uh, there would, there was just, be, I mean, for the third doctor, I went a bit into it because it was, it, that was, that, you know, Pertwee was my doctor. And so I, and it was very much a family. Um, so I did do, um, I did do, uh, um, the Brigadier and the Master, uh, for, uh, Phoebe Waller Bridge. Um, and I did, um, um, uh, Joseph Fines as the Brigadier, uh, because I just think he'd be brilliant. Um, uh, and would bring that, that charm, but also that military kind of, he's played, he's played many soldiers over his career. And indeed, a commander uh, in um, *The Handmaid's Tale*. Um, uh, he um, he's uh, he's really good, and also and yeah, and there's you know, Phoebe Waller Bridge as, as the Doctor. That I suddenly it suddenly struck me um, uh, that of course we should have Jodie Comer as the Master. The, the kind of absolutely the opposite. You know, Phoebe Waller Bridge has dark hair. She has blonde hair. She's played Villanelle so well in *In Killing Eve*. But she's just perfect. Uh, so I did go a bit into that. But the other ones I've kind of steered clear of, apart from Sarah Jane and, and Daphne Ashbrook uh, as Dr. Grace Holloway. So I think those were two um, kind of standout companions for those eras. Um, I'm not saying there weren't other standout companions for any other era, but Sarah Jane was obviously she got her own spin off for starters. Um, and just because it, it uh, with, with, um, I think I called him Gavin Holloway, <laughs> Gary Holloway. Um, <laughs> I am, um, yeah, that just suddenly occurred to me. Um, and uh, uh, I love his performance in Stranger Things anyway. So I just thought he'd be a very soft, he'd, he'd be the, that's the, that, that's for me the crux is like, can you see them playing that role as it was played on TV and bringing their own thing to it? And I think he would be a brilliant uh, Dr. Gary. <laughs> so while we're into companions, I'm going to put your fan casting skills to the test. We've already right. got John Boyega as the 10th Doctor. My very favorite New Who companion of them all is, of course, Donna Noble. Who would you cast oh, opposite John Boyega as Donna Noble? Oh, my word. Oh, my word. Um, okay, so uh, I guess we're talking a redhead. Um Donna was red, wasn't she? Ish. Um, I, I'm tempted to go straight to Rose Leslie. Okay. Uh, um, uh, from again Game of Thrones and indeed um, uh, the Good Fight. Um, I, I, John uh, John Leslie. John Leslie was on Blue Peter. Rose Leslie uh, is I'd, again and again for me. Uh, this casting thing was also a bit of a, a bit of an exercise in these are some of my favorite actors. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, by the way. So Rose Leslie is, is another of my favorite actors and I, I fantasy cast her. I think I fantasy cast all these people um, in uh, some of my TV pitches. So um, yeah, I think I'd go, I'd go it Rose Leslie, I think. Um, and she doesn't, Perhaps she hasn't got the comedy background um, that, that Catherine Tate has, but I think she's capable of it. If you think about how she was with Jon Snow and the whole "you know nothing" <laughs> um, <laughs> thing, um, 
But, you know, God, Donna Noble, I have to say, she's one of my favorites as well. And that is a tough one to do off the top of your head. Right. Um, so I figured we'd just, just have a little exercise. Obviously, there's no right or wrong answers. We're just having fun. No, no, indeed, <laughs> indeed. Oh, wow. Everyone's going to go, what? No, no, she couldn't possibly be Donna Noble. Um, yes. <laughs> And we've, uh, this has been such an, a great exercise, like I said, because then I know other people in commenting, you know, oh, well, I think this person or they've either mm. really agreed with some of the ones like the, the especially the picture you posted of Jack Farthing for casting as a sixth doctor. That was like the perfect picture. It's like, you know what? I'm not as familiar with Jack's work as I am some of the other actors on the on mm. the uh, casting. But that picture since I'm like, oh, yeah, I can see it. So that's good. We'll We'll go with it. Yeah, I've tried to to source pictures that kind of show the kind of outfits I imagine them wearing that are quite often a riff on um, the outfits that you know the the, the actual doctors uh, uh, that I'm recasting them for uh, uh, wore in in the show. Um, obviously, with with um, the first Doctor, I had uh, uh, Liam Cunningham, um, and he's he's always got a beard. <laughs> so I couldn't find one without a beard. But I thought, you know, what would be fine with a beard? It would be going, but even more of a Victorian gentleman, kind of Edwardian gentleman thing going on. Um, and uh, uh, I find one of Tom Hollander with it. Yeah, he, had, he had black tie, he had a tux on, but it was a bow tie at least. <laughs> and he's looking kind of impishly at the camera as well. I mean, it's, it's you know, the thought that I put into it is just way too much. I should be working. Um, <laughs> but and then and then sourcing the pictures takes a while as well because you want to find exactly the right one. You know, sure. I didn't want. You know, there are loads of Phoebe Waller Bridge looking very glamorous and beautiful at award ceremonies, but she's in you know strappy dresses and stuff like that. And I was like, I don't think I could see a doctor in a strappy dress unless it was specifically for you know an evening event. Um, and even then, she'd probably do what the Thirteenth Doctor did and wear <laughs> a tux anyway. So. Um, Yes, it's finding the right uh, uh, pictures of them that show kind of why or what they'd look like, which helps with the whole. And I found, I have to say, I found a brilliant one of um, Rosamund Pike that she almost looks like she's wearing uh, Paul McGann's outfit. Um, And she's got almost like the same um, kind of uh, the hair of a, Raphael cherub kind of thing tumbling onto her shoulder um sorry i'm waxing lyrical now no no <laughs> <laughs> and i guess another question too you've had um like we mentioned whether or not you've had some of the actors or actresses either the, or recasting the role or you're bringing them in for the role that you want to have them do this new one have you had any uh celebrities who you've worked with rich me like hey man when are you when are you gonna put me in for one of these <laughs> Why, why haven't um, you used me yet, Richard? <laughs> um, and we're going to take our last break. Come back and wrap up our conversation with Richard Dinnick. Stand by. Hello. My name is Sylvester McCoy. I want you to listen to Geek to Me a Radio. Otherwise... If you don't, I'll cry. We are back for our final segment. This show would not be possible without the support of the City of St. Charles, the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, That's discoverstcharles.com. Discover ST Charles, Saints abbreviated. Discoverstcharles.com. Check out the website for all the fun things there are to see and do. Even though things are shut down, I mentioned before that businesses are doing curbside pickup. Uh, these restaurants, especially the small shops along Main Street in St. Charles, you want to support these businesses. If you're local, if you're hearing this uh, broadcast and you're in the greater St. Louis, St. Charles area, find out which ones are open. You can go pick up some cobbler for dessert one night at Magpies. Uh, you can uh, pick up some steaks from the uh, Tompkins house. You can order some barbecue from Salt and Smoke. A lot of great little restaurants up and down Main Street uh, that are still doing pickup curbside to stay afloat, support these businesses, help these businesses. Uh, Because obviously we've seen just the catastrophic impact that the pandemic has had on unemployment rates, uh, on businesses. So support them when you can. City of St. Charles has a lot of these and they are a lot of great little places, uh, mom and pop places, restaurants that have been there for literally decades. 
that it would be a shame to see them go under because of this. They're thriving. They're doing the best they can under the circumstances. You can help make that possible. Check out which ones are doing curbside pickup uh, and plan your trip. We're seeing light at the end of the tunnel. Plan your trip. Come to St. Charles. Come hang out. Come explore Frontier Park. Uh, go for a walk up and down the cobblestone streets. Enjoy getting outdoors and getting some exercise. Uh, th this is un th These are unprecedented times, but there's still things we can do. Uh, we can get out. We can enjoy the, the, the local parks and things like that that are reopened. Uh, Historic Main Street is a great place to visit. Frontier Park in St. Charles. And again, support those local businesses that are still doing curbside pickup and delivery. Find out all the information you need at the website, discoverstcharles.com. Very proud to have them as the premier sponsor here on geek to me Radio. Speaking of geek to me Radio, we have our final segment, talking with writer Richard Dinnick. And before we took that last break, I'd asked him if any of his celebrity friends he knows, because he, know, he knows some people. He hobnobs, He's like I said, he's a screenwriter. If any of the celebrity friends have been like, hey, uh, when are you going to put me in there? When are you going to fan cast me? I'd be great for this role. Here's what he had to say about that. I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> okay, all right, we'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they, they, I have been contacted by a couple of people who just like said, oh, it's great fun and stuff like that. They haven't actually kind of, it might have been a subtle nudge, but uh, um, uh, no, I'm, I'm doing this like purely, uh, purely for fun, A, and and B, it's got to be, I've got to really believe uh, they can they can play the role. And we're, we're running out now. Yeah. Um, so let's uh, say we're on 12 of casting New Who now. So we're all tomorrow is like, wow, you know, we're almost up to date. Josie's, uh, Jody Whisker's only been in the role two, three years now. So it's like we're casting someone who's three years, you know, maybe younger than Jody is now. Um, so it's very, very up to date. Um, and, uh, and then, as I say, the exciting thing I think we'll do, maybe I'll give myself a bit of a break and on Tuesday we'll come back and do um, the what if uh, new who, I starting from nine, I guess, or war maybe, uh, was cast back in the 60s and 70s. Um, and I've already done my choices for that. I've already uh, 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 done that. Um uh, and then someone suggested that, OK, then you could do what if New Who was cast both then and now uh, for American actors. Ah, <laughs> that would be a bit of a challenge using strictly American actors. That'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's loads more to do. It depends how long we're going to be in this in this uh, lockdown position. But <laughs> um, I also I should give a plug a little bit for another stupid bit of fun I did, which, which was um, I don't know if you've come across the emoji challenge, um, which uh, I've seen one that is kind of named the, the uh, rock group or band um, uh, purely from emojis. Uh, so like kiss is a kiss <laughs> uh, at its most basic um, and things like that. And then someone else has done a movie one. So I've now done Doctor Who monster, um, name the Doctor Who monsters from the emojis um, uh, challenge, <laughs> which people is, are finding very difficult. I find it incredibly difficult to put together. And some <laughs> of them are, are a little bit of a reach, it has to be said, but it's um, uh, people are getting them. People are being frustrated, but people are getting them. Um, so yeah, if you want to have a bit of fun with that, then we're doing that as well. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to continue doing silly Doctor Who things all the time that we're uh, kind of in lockdown. Um, and there's also I have a bit of a special thing. Uh, I've got a short story, um, uh, an exclusive um, uh, that was actually uh, uh, didn't make. Uh, my Myths and Legends book uh, back a few years back. And there was actually another Dalek story in there. And uh, that was cut because we didn't, they didn't think we, we could have, we, well, not that we couldn't have, but we didn't want to, two Dalek stories. And also there's a great uh, uh, illustration by Adrian Salmon, who did all the illustrations for the book. And I've got actually the illustration of that story hanging on my wall. Um, so we're going to, we were going to show people an unseen uh, Adrian Salmon illustration and an unseen Richard Dinnick short story featuring the Daleks. <laughs> uh, and that, that's going to go up, I think, on my website. And I, I'm, I'm going to try and get someone to do a reading, I think, for it, um, to do a dramatic reading, get an actor or actress to do it. Maybe Gemma Chan. 
<laughs> Maybe Gemma Chat. Oh, tell you what, yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's uh, so. Uh, I don't think we mentioned the website. So if people do want to see that when you drop it, what's what yes, is it just your yes. name or? Yeah, yeah. So it's richarddinnick dot com, um, and actually I'm going to put up um, these castings into a kind of longer blog post, um, and maybe I'll go down the route of casting other other companions. Who knows? Um, uh, uh, put those up on the site and maybe do you know uh, like two or three doctors a day kind of thing with their companions, perhaps expand on it a little bit. It'd be very uh, so fun that, to see some of the companions who you pick for like Ben and Polly to go with Tom Hollander's second doctor. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, obviously the, the yeah. TARDIS crew for Gemma Chan having Tegan, Nissa and Adric and everything. That'd be very interesting to see yeah. their choices. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, the trouble is that there's so many of them. Yeah. I mean, casting the, casting the doctors takes so much time as it is. Um, uh but yeah we'll see we'll see uh yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna just start putting the the thing up uh the, the casting on it as a blog perhaps when i've finished the whole lot when i've done jody i'll i'll put up all those choices and maybe expand on it a little bit with the companions um and then when i've done everything else on done the other two things i was talking about on uh, twitter and facebook then i'll put those up on the website as well well you probably need to stay in lockdown for at least another six months to get all this done richard it sounds like a lot of stuff <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying not it trying to not let it rule my life uh, as i said i've got i do have actual work to do sure so. And so, so uh, you've got uh, talking about the actual work you have to do. If I could keep yes. it just for a few more minutes, um, Lost in Space, obviously season two, and I think they just announced season three on Netflix yeah. is going to be their yeah. final season. Are you still involved with the writing on that one? Uh, yes, we're we're talking about doing more, doing another one. Um, so uh, we'll have to wait and see. Um, at the moment, the comics industry is in an inter interesting state because obviously no one can get out to buy their comics, um, so it's very difficult. People can be sent them if they've if they've subscribed, or they can obviously read them electronically on Comicsology and um, uh, other other electronic platforms. Um, but it's it's a tricky time at the moment. Uh, I'm waiting on two uh, green lights. <laughs> on two projects that are like, well, we'd love to go ahead, and normally we would have done by now, but it's uh, this current situation is is causing a bit of a backlog with the with the green lights. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's unprecedented that what we're going through, and I think uh, social media has proven to be a double edged sword because some people it's a little cringy, but then it's it's lovely the things like you're doing that help uh, people pass this time when we're we're all in lockdown. Oh, so this has been yeah. Uh, well a lot you know, of other people have inspired me to do it. So, you know, and there's, there's some brilliant stuff out there. I mean, all the things that um, Emily's doing at Doctor Who magazine, you know, she's organizing all these um, uh, watch alongs uh, with all the art and the uh, actors and the writers and stuff like that. I mean, that's, that's just been fantastic. It was great to see Russell T Davies join Twitter for uh, the uh, new who day. That was great. Yeah. yeah. And Matt Smith and, and, and uh, Stephen came back for a, for a day or two. He keeps popping up again, actually. <laughs> he can't stay off it. <laughs> it's, it's addictive. Once you get on Twitter, it's hard to uh, let it go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And very last thing, uh, I just want to mention, it was a pleasure to meet you at Gallifrey 1. We finally got oh, to meet in person. So, yeah, absolutely. And that was one of the last cons that really happened uh, right before all this craziness happened. So I'm yeah. glad they got it in before it went down. But you had a fascinating panel that I attended about the comic book art of Doctor Who and all the comic book stuff. That was absolutely yes. riveting. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that was a great idea from Richard Starkings, um, who uh, are several uh, Doctor Who comic writers from down the years. And I was thrilled to be on the panel with, with you know, some real stars of, of Doctor Who magazine, um, uh, past and present. Um, and to go through our kind of memories and looking back at, you know, the, the stuff from the 60s and the 70s and uh, 80s, um, and obviously, you know, all the classic uh, Doctor Who Weekly uh, and Doctor Who Monthly and Doctor Who Magazine <laughs> uh, in its three incarnations, um, all the comic strips from there. And, of course, the Titan ones uh, as well and some great stuff from Nick Abadzis and Kath Scott and, uh, uh, and loads of others. Uh, Jody Hauser uh, is doing a fab job of 13 at the moment. Um yeah, it was really good to look back at all those. And I was just like, I was just 
transported back to my childhood and I was basically going, oh yes, everything I suggested had Daleks in it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you can never get too many Daleks, that's what I say. That, that's true as well, yes, exactly. You can never have, have enough Daleks. And are you already locked in for next year? Uh, well, that depends, doesn't it, really? Um, but I'm no, definitely never locked in. Um, you can never say uh uh that you're definitely gonna I, mean, I would love to be there it depends whether sean is going to be generous enough to ask me um or kind enough to ask me uh whether i can whether i'm going to be out there at the time or um whether i'm going to be if you know heaven forfend that uh i should be working but working would be good <laughs> um and not be able to attend for that reason so i mean i would love to go of course every year i'd love to go to galley and we want to thank you for the time today. Uh, RichardDinnick.com is the website. Uh, we mentioned Facebook and very excited to see the short story and everything like that on the website. Richard Dinnick, yeah. thanks very much for your time today. It's been a blast talking to you. Thank you so much for having me on. And that's going to do it. Another show in the books. My thanks once again to Justin Burnett of Justin's Comics. JustinComics.shop is the website where you can support him if you're outside the local area. Uh, see his online deals, his variant covers you can buy and have shipped directly to you. My thanks also to Richard Dinnick, screenwriter, comic book writer, uh, just complete gentleman and a fantastic, brilliant mind. Until next week, my friends. It's not in the way you watch I sound. Thank you, Scarrow. Good night. Hi, this is James Enstall, host of Geek Me Radio, and in honor of my favorite Themyserian, I've decided to become an Amazon warrior. Harrod, give me strength. The next time you want to buy something from Amazon, go to geektomeradio.com first and click on our Amazon affiliate link. Simply shop like you normally would, and when you check out, a small percentage will go towards supporting the show. So remember, the next time you want to search Amazon for the latest Wonder Woman graphic novel or parts for your invisible jet... Click through from geek 2 me radiocom first. The world was in peril. Would you have me stand by and do nothing? <laughs>